Hi everyone, this is Kara Parfit. I am the Manager of Marketing and Sales Support here at Certant. Thanks so much for joining us today for this discussion on some of the latest trends in cybercrime, uh, the rise in Office 365 hijacking, and, and really some of the best practices you should have in place to protect yourselves and your businesses. Uh, presenting today is Certant Chief Technology Officer, Joshua Steen. Josh is a veteran in the technology space much longer than I've been here, so he, you're, in the, you're in the right hands today. He's been in the IT industry for over 15 years, and 10 of those years have been spent leading the network and security teams in the IT and security industry. Uh, as Chief Technology Officer at Certant, Josh has really had the opportunity to work with many different size companies uh, all over the world, all over the U.S., and really all over the world, large and small, to help design and deploy network infrastructure. So Josh has spent many years of his career as, as a network security analyst at Certain and then moved into a security engineer role and currently helps control and manage the day-to-day -day operations for Certain with a focus on business development, security, culture, and leadership in his current role. But if you have questions at any time during the presentation today, please remember to post them in the Q&A and we'll make sure to address those as they come. And we're also recording today's presentation, so if you have to drop early, hopefully you can stay with us the, the entire time. But if you have to drop, drop early or want to pass this along to others in your organization, we'll be recording and I'll make that available as soon as it is ready after the webinar. So without further delay, I will hand things over to Josh. Thanks, Kara. Uh, thanks, everybody, for uh, joining this morning. I know that everybody's got busy schedules, but uh, hopefully I provide you some good educational material here. So. As Kara mentioned, uh, today we'll be talking about a number of things. I kind of want to paint a picture of what's going on out there in the landscape today and, and why that's relevant to, to you as, a, as an IT person. And also then we're going to talk about Office 365 hijacking, what it is, uh, what it is not, and then some best steps to keep that from happening to your, your organization. And then I'll provide some just overall general best practices from a security perspective. I gave this talk uh, about three months ago uh, at our annual security conference, and we thought that it would be a great idea to, to have a webinar on it so anybody that was not uh, able to come to our security conference could actually see that content. So as, you, as usual, I've got about you know, three webinars worth of information here, so uh, we're going to try to cram this into about 45, 50 minutes, and hopefully you'll stick with me, and uh, we'll get started. So let's talk about uh, uh, some security information we're going to talk about metrics, analytics, everything that's happened in the past year, and that would be 2018. We're going to pull some sources today, and that is coming from the Verizon uh, DBIR, the Sonical Security Report, and the Cisco Security Report as well. There's many reports that are out there for you to use. These just happen to be three that I, that I really like a lot and pull a lot of content from and uh, thought that I would use that information today. So let's get started. A breach. What is a breach? It's an incident that results in, you know, the confirmation of information loss. That means that somebody hacked into your network and we know that information was lost. It's important to know this terminology as I talk through a lot of what we're going to uh, discuss today. An incident. It's an event that has a compromise of the CIA. What's CIA? Confidentiality, integrity, availability. So that means that we know that something happened and we know that they, they looked at things, but that's not necessarily sure that we lost information. So it's really important to know the difference between a breach and an incident as we dive deeper into this information. 2018, top security concern. It really hasn't changed over the years, uh, which is unfortunate, but it's not shocking either. Our top security concern, um, it's still our people, right? It's the people that are sitting behind the desk every day. Um, maybe working at a retail shop and they're on a POS terminal, whatever that might be, it's our people. So we have to make sure that we're providing proper security awareness training to these people. Uh, our employees are our first line of defense, so good training is going to help us as an IT organization if we can provide that training for them to make them a better line of defense since they are really the number one cause and they are a lot of times our first line of defense when it comes to breaches and incidents. SMB under attack. I know a lot of people today that will be viewing this are working in the SMB, so some important information here. 50% of all attacks take place against small businesses. Why is that number so important? Well, because 97% of all businesses in North America are SMB. So that means that the majority of the attacks are happening against those businesses in North America. So 
it's important to know that information and then look at the steps that we can talk about here later that you can use in your organization to help make sure you're not one of these breaches or incidents that we actually talk about. 50% of all alerts logged in the U.S. for SMB go uninvestigated. That means that maybe an IT organization or any organization really has that alerting turned on, but they're not even being looked at. It doesn't really do a lot of good to have that logging capability or and be generating those logs and storing those logs if you don't have anybody looking at those logs. If you go back even to the target breach from years ago, they had all their systems in place, and you know they're not even an SMB, but from a, not looking at logs, like they had all the information in front of them to know that something was taking place. They just weren't looking at the information. So it's very important uh, that we're looking at those logs when they come in. 60% uh, of your customers, they're going to think about leaving you um, if you're breached, and 30% of them will leave if you're breached. So we need to put in place the mechanisms to make sure that none of this happens to us. And it only just takes one time. That is the thing that is really difficult when it comes to a security perspective is that the bad guys only have to be right once. We have to be right every single day. We have to be diligent about this stuff, and it's not easy, and, and I'm not going to be here today to tell you that it's easy, but just to provide you a, a better understanding of what's going on out there. So let's keep going. Um, 2018 by the numbers, right? Here are the number of incidents and breaches by sector. Um, if you look here, accommodation uh, is pretty close to the top. Healthcare, information, public sector is out there. It's interesting to, to always look at these numbers and see where people are targeting. Now, please also know these numbers right here come from the Verizon report. And this are, these are only ones that are confirmed. These are not ones that happen, which there are hundreds and hundreds of breaches and incidents that happen every year that they're never documented and nobody ever hears about. These are the ones that are documented that we do know about. Breaches by pattern. Again, I'm painting a picture here to get to the, you know, get to the ending, which is the Office 365 hijacking. But look, web application. Um, the top one there, 414 known breaches were by um, web applications. Why is this an issue? It only takes hackers minutes uh, to compromise a machine, to get into your network, but then it goes months before they're even discovered. So think about that. Again, what I said earlier, they only have to be right one time. We have to be right all the time. They also can get in in minutes, and then it's taking us months to actually discover that something's going on. And a lot of times, it's not even the organization themselves that find out that something is going on. If someone else reports to them that they're seeing malicious behavior coming off of their network, that leads them to understand and find out that they've been breached or they've been compromised. So here's some numbers by actual sector, right? So we have education, um, and uh, social engineering schemes are big when it comes to, to education. They're targeting employees, and education sees a, a really large uptick because of the PII information that's out there. Uh, as I talked about at our security conference, why is education such a hot topic right now for people to find? Well, there's a few reasons. They have limited funding on what they can put out there for um, security mechanisms, meaning it, it makes it easier for people to get and steal data. Well, you're thinking, well, this is just education. What all could they find? Could they maybe change grades? Well, of course, but they're out there looking for PII data, and part of that data would be social security numbers. And then you have individuals that are minors. They're under 18. And up until last year, you weren't able to actually freeze credit for a minor. You can do that now, but before then you wouldn't. It was a very um, high-level attack where they would come in and they're going after kids and taking their Social Security number because they could create fake identities using these Social Security numbers. And nobody would know until the kid turned 18 and went to file for a credit card. So that's the reason why they were targeting education was to steal that data. From a financial perspective, it's still kind of the same. People are looking for ATMs. They're doing uh, payment card skimmers. You know, a good thing there is always remember to, you know, sh shake the, the gas pump, you know, from that perspective whenever you're putting your credit card in, even from an ATM perspective, cover your hand whenever you're typing your PIN in. Not real sure how many people use an ATM these days. Uh, couldn't remember personally how long it's been since I did that to get cash. People do do that. But I would also tell you, if you're ever a, a part of a, an, a jackpotting where that means that the ATM just spits out money, that is not your money. So you need to make sure that if you're ever a part of that, and that does happen, 
uh, more than you would think it does. But just know that uh, if you're part of an ATM jackpot that you don't actually get to keep that money and you should return it. Um, let's go into a couple other sectors here. Manufacturing and accommodation. Uh, manufacturing is big because they're trying to steal intellectual property, right? They want to know what these people are building, what they're doing. They didn't want to replicate that. From an accommodation standpoint, uh, most of these tax um, are external. And they're after POS data because, again, they're looking for uh, credit card information. Another thing that we've actually seen from an accommodation standpoint is that people are moving away from the POS network and sometimes they're moving towards what we would consider like a back office or a dirty network and that might be where the manager's PC is held and they're doing that because they're looking for networks that aren't highly secure but people are still doing things on that. So you might have managers that are doing payroll, PII data. You might have managers or other employees that are doing their own banking on those uh, machines. They're trying to scrub that data. Or we have even run into instances where people are unknowingly to higher level management taking orders off of those back office machines and storing credit card information. So again, they're kind of shifting their focus a little bit to machines that they feel like are less controlled and they're able to get just the same amount of data from that. And then you have retail, kind of the same from, a, from an accommodation standpoint, POS, um, they're looking for that credit card data, PII data. You have health healthcare, which it's always interesting to look at healthcare because a lot of times um, you'll see the shift is about 50-50. And in 2018, it was 56% of those uh, breaches or incidents actually came from internal. So that could mean that maybe you have a curious employee that they're you know, a movie star or whoever happened to show up at the hospital or the doctor's office and they're wanting to get more informa information and they're abusing their access. So it's really important if you're in the healthcare field to make sure that you have um, proper roles and responsibilities set up for users so uh, they're not sharing that information and, and quite honestly, maybe they don't even have access to that information. What are the motives? Really, you know, the motives haven't changed too much. Um, the largest motives are financial and espionage. People either want money or they want to get that intellectual property so they can go recreate um, what uh, the person they're attacking is doing. You know, China is notorious for that. Uh, coming into the U.S., stealing a lot of trade secrets, taking them back, building fighter jets, everything else. Um, it's big business, so um, just keep that in mind a little bit. Here's some good information from um, the SonicWall report. You know, in 2018, there were 10.5 billion malware attacks. Um, ransomware continued to go up. It went up 11%. Um, they saw 3.9 trillion intrusion events, 27% uh, jump in encrypted threats. And why is that important? You know, we preach this a lot to our customers, but being able to inspect that uh, encrypted traffic is super important. If you're not doing that today, then, you know, please reach out to us or, and uh, talk to us about how you can actually get in the middle of those encry encrypted traffic and start doing some uh, scanning of that traffic. You need to know what it is. You know, 80 to, you know, 85% of all the traffic that's leaving your network is encrypted these days. So you want to be able to get in the middle of that data and get in the middle of that data the right way to be able to scan it to make sure um, it is legitimate traffic and it's not malicious. Of the malicious software downloads that SonicWell saw in 2018, 39% of them contain ransomware. Uh, that was a large uptick as well. So it's still prevalent out there that people are trying to get you to download ransomware because they want Bitcoin. You know, this is big business these days. It's not actually, uh, you know, a kid in the basement or anything like that. People are looking to make big money off this, and they are successfully doing that. I love this slide. You know, had a great talk at the conference about this slide. But um, if you look at this, this is comes from the Cisco report here. Look at the pricing that's on some of this, and we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit. So this is actual business now, but anybody can do this. So, like, you can run out there and make money if you want to. For 5 bucks. you know, you can get a credit card or debit card to use online. That's fraudulent. For $5, you can do this. You know, for 400 bucks, you can send a million malicious spam emails that contains ransomware. You know, you can get a kit out there that will do that for you or sign up for a subscription service even that will do that for you. You know, for a dollar... Uh, you can get a PC malware installation. Uh, for 20 bucks, you can get a VPN into some organization to send data through that if you wanted to, so you could obfuscate where you're coming from. Again, I've said this a few times, but 
and I even talked about this last year, but it used to be a lot of times when we talked about uh, hacking and things like that, it started off as, you know, in college or the kids doing that. And there were, there was malicious stuff going on in the world at a much larger scale, but not like it is today. I mean, it is big business. You know, you hear about Russian organizations where they run them like businesses. They work Monday through Friday, eight to five. They give their employees weekends off. They have better customer support than a lot of, unfortunately, you know, IT service providers or internet service providers have themselves these days. So they run it as a big business. They're billion dollar businesses that are based around cybercrime. So we need to take this stuff seriously. And I'll talk about this a little bit later, but a lot of times in the SMB world, we always say, well, why us? You know, people aren't going to attack us because we're small. We don't really have anything. It's kind of the opposite of that. They're, they're going to attack you because you probably don't have the funds or the time to secure things like you should. So it's almost like when a burglar goes up to a door, if the door is unlocked, they're going to walk in. If the door is locked, they're going to walk away and go to the next house. They really don't want to you know, have to go through breaking windows or anything like that. They just want to walk through the front door. So they're just shaking doorknobs and seeing however they can get into that house or which house they can get into the easiest. So phishing, right? Phishing is a big one. Um, over the last couple of years, this has really seen a, seen a rise. And what is phishing? Phishing is when, you know, somebody's sending out those 400, you know, emails or million emails that I just talked about where they're trying to get somebody to do something that they shouldn't, right? And they're just sending it out blasts. And, and we've all got those, the Nigerian prince that, you know, has $5 million and all you got to do is wire him $10,000 and you're going to get your $5 million uh, inheritance. Um, that's the phishing emails that we're talking about. In 2018, there was a 65% increase uh, according to Fish Me, and phishing emails that were sent. Uh, the good news, it took 16 minutes before somebody actually first clicked on that phishing email. That's, that's up a little bit from what it was in 2017. The bad news, 76% 76 of businesses reported phishing attacks. Uh, that's a lot of businesses that actually reported uh, phishing attacks. Also, 30% of phishing campaigns were opened. That means that there's a lot of attacks going on and there's a lot of people that are opening up those phishing campaigns. 12% of the users inside of those phishing campaigns actually click the link that uh, is there. Um, less than 17% of the phishing incidents um, are actually reported. So if 76% of businesses actually reported phishing attacks and there's still another 17% that aren't reporting phishing attacks, it's big, big business and it's happening a lot. And a lot of times what's happening uh, when these phishing campaigns go out is that people aren't even letting their organization know that they did something. Um, whether they're embarrassed or maybe they don't even realize they did something, they're not letting anybody know. So it's an important from a security awareness training that you're actually training your employees to let you know when something goes wrong. Again, remember, first line of defense is your employees. Train them well. So if you let them know that, hey, if you do something wrong, you're not going to get in trouble for it from a phishing perspective, an email perspective, but we need to know, um, that is drastically going to um, help you moving forward when it comes to phishing attacks. The biggest problem here is 97% of people uh, can't identify a phishing email, and that came from uh, McAfee in 2018. So that means that only 3% of people can actually uh, tell you what a phishing email is. And here's some examples of them. We've seen these before, but just some things that you can think about. You know, train people to look from the from. Is the from actually who it says it's from? As you can he see here, this is supposedly from PayPal. They're trying to get you to restore your account because they're shutting it down. But as we can see here, this is not the actual sender. You can also see that it's got suspicious content in it. Um, please make sure that your users are aware of that. Bad grammar, notorious for phishing campaigns for bad grammar, and there's a reason behind that as well. They're trying to get to the people that don't notice the bad grammar or don't even know that it is bad grammar because they're more likely to click on the link. And also remember to hover over. You know, hover over your link. If it's on your phone, remember that you can hold down the link on your phone to see where that link's going. You know, I know a lot of times in the past people have said, well, it's on my phone, my users, they don't know what to do. You can actually hold down on that. It's going to bring up the link and tell you where it's going before uh, you actually go to that link. Here's another one. Uh, they're trying to create some urgency around this, right? 
hey, you know, here's this file. I need you to look at it really quick. They're trying to get you to do something uh, in a hurry so you don't have time to actually slow down and think about what's going on here. And then, you know, again, this is one from Amazon. We get these quite often when it comes to the Amazon stuff. Everybody loves Amazon, so they're going to do whatever they have to to, to get their uh, Prime membership to continue on or maybe receive some reward. But if we look here, look where the sender came from. This definitely is not coming from um, an Amazon address. Big number here. Talked about a big increase in uh, phishing campaigns. There's 1.5 million new phishing sites created per month, not per year, but per month. There's over a million new phishing sites created every month. Uh, so it's big business. It happens a lot. It's something that we need to think about and we need to start protecting our organizations against. Social engineering, um, email edition, right? So this is pretexting. So pretexting is a little bit different from a phishing. Sometimes they get combined into what they are, but pretexting is more like a rifle approach where I look at phishing being more like a shotgun approach. Pretexting is going to go after certain people. Um, there was a 110% increase in pretexting according to PhishMe uh, in 2018. They likely target executives, human resource, finance. Uh, and what they're trying to do is they're trying to create urgency um, around some event. As you saw in one of those phishing uh, examples that I sent you, what they're trying to get you to do is take some action very quickly. So what they're doing is they're targeting financial people because they have finance data. They're targeting executives because executives have access to that financial data. They have access to bank accounts. And they're tar targeting human resource is because they have access to almost all of that plus all the PII data for organizations. So what they do is they actually um, maybe look for one or two individuals in the organization, and they send them emails that are very specific um, about that individual or the organization. An example of this would actually be something that happened to us about four or five years ago. That's the reason why I say it could happen to anyone. Um, at that point in time, our accountant uh, was on vacation and received an email from Mike Johnson, who is the owner of our company, but it really wasn't Mike Johnson. And if you looked at the email, uh, the, the from address would actually tell you that. But we had a couple things working against us. She was on her mobile phone. She was in a hurry because she was on vacation and she was getting ready to take her car in for maintenance. She saw an email very quickly from Mike Johnson. All she saw was the from name, not the actual email address. And it said, hey, you know, such and such, um, I need you to wire X amount of dollars. It ended up being around $25,000 to this address so I can, or account number, so I can pay this invoice. She proceeds to go on with this. Luckily, we had mechanisms in place to keep uh, the, day, the, uh, the money from ever leaving the organization. However, it could happen to anyone, and it happens that easily. Somebody sends you know, your, um, your accountant at your organization an email that says, hey, this is the, the boss, and they need money to pay off this invoice please do this as quickly as possible. I know that you're in a meeting or I know that you're on vacation or whatever, but I need this done. It's an urgent, you know, I need this to happen. Well, they're trying to be helpful. It's human nature. They're preying on human nature, which is for most people to be helpful. You want to help somebody and then they're trying to get you to do it as quickly as possible so you don't identify everything that's happening. The from email address, the subject, the unlikely nature that it's coming from an, from an email address that they would never send it from, that they would actually do this via email instead of over the phone or face to face. They just prey on human nature to get you to take that action, and then you could potentially lose quite a bit of money. Uh, social engineering, the Twitter edition. Uh, this was a good one, and uh, I, I blocked some stuff out here so you can't actually see it, but this was a tweet that was going around in May, and before, you know, I, when I stopped looking at it, it had over uh, four or 5,000 retweets and, I mean, thousands and thousands of likes. And, I mean, thousands of replies where people were giving information. Now, some people eventually caught on to it. Others didn't. But if you look at this, you know, somebody funnily put something out there. Well, what personality do you have? Well, look at these questions. What was the name of your first pet? What was your high school mascot? What's your favorite band? Where did you or where do you want to meet your spouse? So what are those questions? Those questions are typically password reset questions. So what they were doing on a large social media platform 
was sending this out here, getting people to retweet it. People were replying, giving all this information, and now that what was created was a large database to be able to start trying to social engineer and hack into people's accounts, whether that's passwords, bank accounts, whatever that might be. People were freely giving that information away. And most people didn't even understand what they were doing. They thought they were just being a part of some social experiment that was going out there and just taking part on Twitter. But really, they, some, they were getting social engineered to give up information that are secure secrets to accounts. So it was pretty interesting to, to see this and uh, how it took off. So uh, let's kind of really get into now the Office 365 stuff. And how I look at this is, you know, everybody typically has an attic in their house. And I always say, have you checked your attic lately? Like, attic lately? And that to me is your Office 365 tenant, right? So it's like, what was that noise? With something in there. So I get to digging around, and I think we've all heard these stories about where somebody found somebody living in a closet or somebody found somebody living in an attic. And I ended up, while creating this um, talk, spending hours down a rabbit hole of just finding all these stories, and I couldn't stop. I couldn't stop, and I'm sitting on the couch and um, had just moved, you know, about a, about a year ago, and I, I'm talking to my wife about this stuff, and immediately she was like, you need to go check the attic. So I did go check the attic. Uh, there was nobody in the attic, but uh, even like this one. So this is a good. This is a funny story right here. This guy kept hearing noises and everything. He jumps up in his attic and he finds out that there's a lady been living up there for three months. Um, he kicks her out. The cops come. They say, you know, why were you living there? And she said, well, John told me that I could live here. And that guy's name was not John. And he's like, so they never thought anything about it. Three weeks later, the guy hears somebody up in his attic again. He's thinking, how did this lady get back in my house? So he goes up there, and he found John. John was actually staying up there, so John had you know, invited that lady to stay there. And there's lots of these. You know, a homeless woman was living in a man's closet you know, for over a year in Japan, and uh, a North Carolina student you know, found another guy living in her closet for five or six months. This one is hilarious to me because he got deemed the reverse Santa because he was living in this family's attic, and what he would do is he would come down at night or when they left, and he would take things, and then he would write down on a list what he called his Christmas list of the things that he took. So he got named the reverse Santa. Um, this one happened you know, in our backyard at Ohio State. A uh, kid was uh, living with uh, his cousins uh, in a shared house, still had a key. When his cousins moved out, he boarded up one of the rooms made it look smaller than it was, stayed there, lived there for a couple quarters before somebody found him. And um, then this woman finds a stranger living in her attic, and the reason why she found out that there was a guy in her attic is that she was laying in the bathtub one night and looked up above and noticed that the uh, attic light was on and could see somebody that was up in there. And uh, she had been living in that apartment for over a year. So, so creepy stuff, but that to me is – you're kind of laying into Office 365 hijacking. So a nefarious actor, you know, they gain access to your user account, your attic, right? And they do that via a password database dump, a phishing attack, social engineering, all the stuff that we just talked about above. That's how they're getting access to those user accounts. If you have Office 365, portal.office.com, email address, um, password get you in. So if I got your password by one of these means, then I'm in, unless you have some other means of uh, security in place. Then a lot of times what they'll do is the actor will create forwarding rules looking for spe specific information, whether that's banking information, PII data, or just some type of conversation. They're just waiting and laying there. Sometimes these accounts will be compromised for months and people don't know that, and they're just waiting for the right time to attack. Um, once Whatever that is they're looking for gets triggered, that actor springs into action. They'll forward all the communication off-site, so uh, you're not getting it into your mailbox. They'll start impersonating that person. They'll automatically delete all correspondence. A lot of times what happens when we help customers determine there was an O365 hijack, you go to that deleted box, there'll be tons of email in there where all that email is getting deleted uh, because they didn't want the person that actually owned the account to know what was going on. They didn't want them getting that information. So here is a, a good example of an Office 365 hijack that's going on right now. So again, what they're doing is they're creating that urgency about you to do something. So this one right here is they're telling you that from an O365 perspective, 
they're going to terminate your email and um, unless you click this link and cancel the request now, right? So what happens, almost all of your users, if they've not been through training and they don't know any better, they're going to click that and they're going to say cancel this request now. Well, this is what happens. They go to this login, and this is a legitimate login page. But if you looked, and we blurred this out up here, um, what somebody did is they created a survey on live.com to make it look like uh, a login page. So what you're really doing here is you're going to type in your email address for your Office 365 account. You're going to type in your password and click Submit, and you get a thanks. Your response was received. Everything's good. You think that you've walked away, and my email is saved. They're not going to cancel my account, and my account's not getting deleted. But what really happened is they've just created a database of all of these Office 365 accounts and credentials that they can now get into and they can do um, nefarious things with. So let's walk through this one a little bit. And this is kind of a real-world example um, of somebody, um, a customer of ours that this, this happened to. So, uh, so we got the nefarious actor up here, right? Uh, we got Moneybags Magoo up here, and then we have the customer down here. Moneybags actually wants to pay his invoice. So what happens is, is he's letting him know via an email that ends up because the nefarious actor is already inside because of the email that I just showed you before. Uh, and he's got forwarding rules that are set up around invoicing and money. So he's getting email to a, an external email account. The customer is still getting their email. And this email gets there, and they open it, and they read it. And it says, hey, I want to pay my invoice. It's of, you know, about $40,000. Again, this is real. This happened. Um, just making sure that uh, this is where I should send the money, right? I mean, if I'm transferring or uh, paying an invoice, I want to make sure that I have the right numbers that, I, that I'm going to be transferring this money to. So what happens is this guy jumps into action. He blocks him from being able to respond back to it unknowingly, right? He doesn't know that his response is not going to get there. Because I own the account as a nefarious actor. I own the account too, and I can put things in there. So he blocks it, and then he says, okay, well, I'm going to write him back as the customer and say, sure, you know, I'm ready. You can pay me. I'm super appreciative of this $40,000, but by the way, I changed my account information, and here's my new account and routing number that I need you to send this information to. So Moneybags Magoo says, sure, why not? I'll send the money. You know, you're the customer. It's coming from your email address, and boom, that hits there. He has the money. The transfer goes through. The customer's out 40K. This is real life. This happens all the time. This happened to a customer that we know of um, that we were able then to go back in and help them figure out why um, this had taken place. They, they had no idea what was going on. And through some analysis that we did, uh, we were able to determine that the account had been taken over and somebody had created forwarding rules and put that information in there. And it, that seems very easy, what I just showed you, but it, it is easy to do because of the tools that are out there on the one side where you can just buy all of that stuff. But it is also big business. We're talking about 40K there, right? So some things there is that that's a lot of money. So make sure that you're training your users properly for that stuff and paying attention to uh, your Office 365 quote unquote attic. So how can we uh, put some security around this, right? Enable multi-factor authentication. It's one of the very first things you can do um, for your Office 365 tenant is make sure you've got MFA enabled on that. Um, you can do that through Duo. You could do it through Microsoft Authenticator if you want to, but that is another means of authentication that somebody has to have to be able to get in there. So even if somebody did go through the whole routine of following that fake email, and they get in there, they still probably don't have access to that person's code or push notification to be able to get in from an MFA uh, perspective. Make sure that you only have dedicated tenant administrator accounts. A lot of times what we'll see is people running with uh, multiple users or one or two users that are normal email accounts that have access to everything that are a full on global admin. Make sure that you have dedicated tenant administrator accounts for your Office 365 tenant. Enable unified audit and logging. This is a big one. They have a great security and compliance center in Office 365. 
Uh, there's a lot of things that you can do in there, but make sure that you're enabling that auditing and logging. You need to know when things are happening, suspicious activities taking place. If you don't know and you can't audit, audit that stuff, then you really have no clue that anything's going on at that point in time. Um, enable mailbox auditing. Put auditing on your mailboxes to see if somebody's doing something to a mailbox. Are they putting in forwarding alerts? Um, is somebody deleting email? You can put that type of auditing into your O365 tenant. You know, create those forward alerts, or if you want to, dis disable the ability to forward email. Uh, I've had a big push lately when giving advice to recent customers that they're moving towards just disabling the ability to forward email. Uh, some organizations can't do that, but what you could do is build alerts into whenever somebody actually modifies or creates a new forward on a mailbox or a distribution group. It creates an alert to the administrators um, of your Office 365 tenant and lets them know that some activity took place. So again, if somebody happened to get in and they go to make a change and add that forward, you would be notified immediately that that took place and you would know something was going on. You could temporarily disable that account, go talk to the user to see if it was legitimate. Uh, if it was, you could re-enable the account. If it wasn't, then you would know that you needed to take some action on there. PowerShell scripts for auditing. There's a ton of PowerShell scripts that are out there for alerts, forwards, rules that are out there that you can use. Uh, Microsoft does a great job of showing you some GitHub stuff that you can so that you can do out there. If anybody wants to contact me after this, I'm more than happy to talk about some of these scripts as well. Some more stuff. Um, if you're not uh, familiar with it or not, Microsoft in O365 actually has a security score where you know the, the idea isn't to achieve a perfect score, but it is to have a pretty good score. And you can do that by going to the Security and Compliance Center. It will show you all these checkboxes that you can do, all the different auditing, logging, MFA that you can turn on to help keep your score going up. The higher the score, the more secure you are. Some other things you can do from, a, from an, just an overall mail perspective, deploy some type of safe link scanning, whether that is the ATP scanning from Microsoft Office 365, or if you have something like a Barracuda or a Proofpoint Essentials that has uh, safe link scanning, that's something that you need to look at as an organization. What that means is if you get an email link in, when you click on that link, it actually uh, scrubs that link to see if it's a malicious website for you. Think of it kind of like a content filtering for your email from a link perspective. Deploy attachment defense. Again, you could use Office 365 attachment defense if you wanted to. Um, the Proofpoint one, as I talked, Barracuda, any of those, SonicWall, but you have the ability then to look at those attachments. Depending on who the, the product is, you can send it off, and it will detonate it in a sandbox and let you know whether that attachment is good or not. So I would be pushing you and urging you to use that type of attachment defense as well. Use some uh, anti-phishing policies. Microsoft has some built in. You can use uh, uh, do phishing campaigns against your organization from things such as Sophos has that, Fish Me, but uh, making sure that you have policies in place against uh, phishing activity that's going to be taking place. So Office 365 Security Center, what is it? So just some screenshots of here what it is. Like if you log into your tenant and you go into your security and compliance uh, center, what you'll see is like a total score here, like this tenant is 97 out of 507. You can see kind of some actions that they've taken place. So from an identity perspective, you can see that um, they're rising here. You can see from a data perspective, they've done 12 out of the 219 points that you can have, taking no action on device or apps. Um, some of the anti-phishing policies I was talking about right from this Security and Compliance Center home dashboard, you can click on this and start adding your phishing policies. You can add your spam policies. Uh, you can look at all your quarantine if you want to. Then here's your overall security score. You can see where you score, um, what points you're gaining over the month. You can see different things uh, that you're turning on from improvement actions that you can actually take. So there's eight completed, there's 49 not completed. You know, such things as require MFA for Azure AD privilege roles, uh, require MFA for all users, you know, turn mailbox auditing on for all users, register all users for multi-factor authentication. These are all steps that Microsoft puts out there for you and helps you with to make sure that you're securing your Office 365 tenant. Really, at the end of the day, it's just about time and, and what can you put forth the effort to make sure that you're uh, Office 365 tenant is actually secure. You can dig deeper down into this. So what you can do is as you get down into these improvement actions, you can actually click on these actions 
It'll tell you whether it's uh, complete or not complete or in progress. It'll tell you what the source is of the action that needs to take place. It'll show you what the ranking is and the score that would be provided. And then what happens is once you actually click into this to view, it'll tell you the settings about this and what you need to do. And it'll actually take you to, if it's a GitHub PowerShell link, it'll actually take you to um, the GitHub site to where you can get that PowerShell script to um, maybe like this one. This one's update folder permissions, right? We need to know whenever somebody's uh, doing mailbox loading for all users, we want to know that. You do that through a PowerShell script. And this clicks through from your Office 365 Security and Compliance Center, takes you to that GitHub section, you know, allows you to pull down that PowerShell script, run it against your Office 365 tenant. Um, and again, here you can just uh, dig into this a little bit more. This tells you uh, actions over like the last 30 days. What actions have you taken over the last uh, 30 days to secure your um, tenant a little bit more? So that was a lot of the Office 365 hijacking best practices from an Office 365 tenant perspective. So now let's just uh, try to wrap up here uh, with some normal security best practices for your organization. MFA can save the day. I think as most people know me, I'm really big about MFA. I talk about it a lot, preach it, but I feel like every website should have to have MFA. It shouldn't even be an option. You should have to run it. Um, hopefully one day we'll get there. But security awareness training, talked about that a lot. Provide some security awareness training, you know, a couple times a year. Uh, do security awareness training. Know before actually has a free security awareness training that's out there that you can use. It's really good. Uh, we've used it before in-house for our own organization. I would recommend that to people. Uh, patch management, as we talked about, 60% of businesses were breached uh, because of a patch that uh, they didn't fix that was known to be fixed. So make sure you're, you're doing your patch management out there. Vulnerability scans. 30% uh, of uh, businesses that were breached did absolutely no vulnerability scan. So get a vulnerability scan. I would, I would tell you do quarterly vulnerability scans uh, from an external side. That would be perfect as an organization to have that run against uh, your public domains, your IP addresses to see what's vulnerable out there. I would have an internal vulnerability scan run if I was doing it again once a quarter, but you need to be running that to make sure that um, you're patching uh, whatever's going on. These kind of go hand in hand, right? Run your vulnerability scans, then patch. Run your vulnerability scans and patch. From a patch management perspective too, you can sign up for lots of websites that tell you when things are coming. It goes right to your inbox just about taking that action. Um, MFA, twofactorauth.org, great website that tells you all the sites that offer uh, MFA or 2FA. Highly recommend it. Our uh, Customer portal ourselves, www.mystudent.com, actually runs MFA or 2FA of your choice as well if you want to enable it under your account settings. Control admin rights, right? Been preaching this one too, but don't operate as domain admin, no local admins, run Microsoft Flaps. We definitely uh, do not want to make, we definitely want to make sure that nobody's running as a domain admin as their actual login. And we want to make sure people don't have local admin rights. Um, that way we can keep people from actually installing programs if something happens or elevating privileges and jumping across uh, your network. You know, over here, keep it simple, stupid, right? Lock down non-standard ports. 19.2% of all malware attacks in 2018, according to a SonicWall cybersecurity report, uh, came across the non-standard ports. To me, a little bit, again, like locking the door. If you're not going to use the ports, then why have them open? Just lock it down so people don't have those means to make sure that uh, they can get in or get out. Uh, VPN for remote access, no direct RDP. Come on, we're past RDP. Um, we can all uh, get a VPN spun up some way, somehow, make sure that we're providing that access over an encrypted channel. Uh, back in May, there was a new RDP bug that uh, came out, so if you're not aware of that still, please make sure you run out there and patch that. Um, add an external stamp to email. This seems very, you know, simplistic, but it has a 50% uplift in preventing incidents if you actually just have it that comes stamped across in the subject line that people pay attention to that. It prevents 50% of malicious activity via email. This is really easy to do. Um, Office 365 has this integrated into it to where you can turn this on. Um, monthly account review. 26% uh, of all user accounts are stale in somebody's environment. Let's make sure that we're getting that those updated. And if it's a um, 
potentially an issue where we're letting employees go in an organization and we're just not paying attention to that stuff, involve HR. HR should have a great policy in place for whenever somebody leaves the organization, and that should be a, a, a check mark on a sheet that somebody has to sign off on. Uh, network segmentation, uh, we've got to control lateral movement, right? Let's not let people jump around the network if they don't need to. And network segmentation doesn't mean create a bunch of VLANs and then no access rules. Network segmentation means create some VLANs for roles and responsibilities that are fitting, and then lock down the access to each machine and device and appliance and user inside those networks so they only get to where they need to get to and vice versa. I would also tell you that in this day and age, we need to be looking at some SIM technology. It's not enough just to prevent things at the gateway or have um, endpoint protection. We need to be looking at all the logs from all of our appliances, from all of our users, and bringing into that to one spot that is spitting out some alerts and logs at a very high level, and we're looking at that lateral movement that's going on and letting us know that, hey, something just doesn't seem right here. And finally, really, for me, um, Back up your data. Um, you know, you've got to have a backup. So if everything goes wrong and something happens to your data, do you actually have the data that you said you were backing up? So my advice is, uh, from experience, make sure you back up your data, but make sure you test that data uh, quarterly that it, to make sure it is good. So do a restore of that data to make sure it's there. Uh, document your security policies. You know, I've been harping on educating your employees, which is something you should most definitely do. But if you educate those employees and you leave out two questions in that education, and that is what do I do and who do I tell, then it doesn't do much good to educate them. Because if you, if you give them all this education and the tools, but then they don't know what to do and they don't know go, who to go tell when something happens, then you kind of defeated the purpose of providing the training. So let's just make sure that um, we provide that training, but we also tell them, uh, hey, what's next steps and who should I go contact? So kind of have a little flow chart or a tree of who they should go talk to. Maybe that's their direct manager. Their direct manager brings that up to maybe a, a risk management team, whoever that might be, but you can put that in place. If you want help, if anybody wants help with this stuff, more than happy to provide some advice, some documentation on how to make sure that that happens. And, and finally, I think that for once in my life, I've, I've stayed pretty much on time. That is it. I would like to thank everybody for attending. Again, um, my contact information down here in the, in the lower right, uh, joshua.schemesatcertain.com. Please email me with any of your questions. Free to have chats with you, uh, give you feedback, answer questions. And uh, I did have one question that kept popping up there, and it, and it was, if you could only do two things, you know, well, I kept getting, if you could only do one thing, and some people would say two things, so we'll go with two things. Um, to secure my Office 365 tenant, what would it be, right? Well, you know, if I only had two choices, I would tell you that it's setting up your alerts because it does you no good um, if you don't know what's going on inside of it, so, you know, of your tenant, meaning if somebody gets in, then we need to make sure that uh, we know that somebody's doing something inside of that setting up forwards. But the big one, too, is setting up multi-factor authentication. Don't make it easy. I'll make it hard for people to get in and do this stuff. So even if your user messes up and accidentally uh, clicks the link unknowingly or, you know, was just in a rush and got caught up in a pretexting or a phishing, um, you have that ability to have that MFA there to where um, you set that up for them and it's hard for the other person to get in. But, again, thank you for the time today and uh, really happy to be able to present for everybody. Thanks, Josh. We did actually have one other question. I'm pretty sure I had it covered, but just want to confirm the data with you. In the, the very first part of the presentation when you referenced SMBs in the U.S., you're, or 97% of businesses being SMBs in the U.S., um, what, did that, what data did that point to as far as how it defined the size of the SMBs? And just wanted to confirm that really it was referencing businesses under $50 million in revenue and under 2,000 employees. Do you believe that? that that is that is accurate. You know, there and that's one of the that's the crux really of a lot of data anymore out there when it comes to defining SMB enterprise or mid tier. Uh, everybody has a different uh, meaning for it, right? But uh, really, the data that we were looking at today was less than 2,000 employees, and uh, was I think actually a little bit less than 50 million in, in revenue. But uh, and that would be uh, a majority of the audience that we typically talk to. Great. 
Well, thanks, Josh, for the time, and thanks, everybody, for attending today. Uh, just a reminder, again, this recording will be made available, so please make sure to share within your organizations, and please don't hesitate to contact us if you have any follow-up questions. Enjoy the rest of your day.